Chapter 13, Places of Power The afternoon brought cool relief. Don Juan and I had hiked to a place where volcanic eruptions had taken place millions of years ago. The area was strewn with huge chunks of lava and pieces of shiny obsidian that spread out on the desert like a lumpy gray carpet. The Yaqui Indians regard this as a place of power, Don Juan remarked. They say that there is energy trapped in all this lava rock. What kind of energy? I asked catching my breath. The kind of energy that can make one discover things of the past. All one has to do is pick up a rock, be silent, and listen to its message. Do you really believe rocks can talk? I asked. Isn't that a bit far-fetched? Don't take my word for it, Don Juan replied. Find out for yourself whether or not it's true. He pointed to a hill not far from where we were. Let's hike to the top of that mound. That's the best spot to listen to rocks. We walked over the uneven terrain. Even though I had on a pair of thick crepe-soled shoes, the rocks and obsidian glass were sharp and the loose stones made walking difficult. I was careful to avoid the patches of tuna cactus with thorny spines that jutted out between the clumps of rock. I had once been told that cactus spines were extremely dangerous, for they could lodge themselves in the body and travel to the heart or even to the brain, causing sudden death. I didn't know whether or not that was true, but I wasn't about to put the theory to a test. When we reached the top of the promontory, I was winded. I sat down to rest, taking in the magnificent view. I could see the entire desert valley with its winding highway weaving in a southeasterly direction. The purple hills in the distance lay like a jagged cutout against the sky. Seemingly from nowhere a solitary crow flew toward us cawing as it passed overhead, Don Juan looked up to note its direction of flight. It was flying into the afternoon sun. Does the flight of crows mean anything in particular? I asked. You bet it does, he replied dusting off his hat. Especially if one has an affinity with them. Crows can be bearers of messages, but it's easy to misinterpret the omens. What happens if you get the message wrong? I asked. All sorts of unfortunate things, he said solemnly. You could wind up going full speed ahead when you should be biding your time. Or you could miss an appropriate turn in the road because you hesitate to act. You mean a crow could save your life? I said. It could, Don Juan agreed. Crows and other entities serve as guides. They tell a sorcerer what to do and when to do it. In the warrior's world, timing is crucial. If you miss your chance, it may never come again. The finality of his words gave me a chill. I knew what he meant. There was a condition of being out of synchronization with life. It was a feeling of inner imbalance, of never catching the crest of the wave and riding with it but always having it break on top of you. Therefore, instead of a breathtaking ride, one feels tumbled, overwhelmed, as if something had crashed upon one full force when one wasn't ready or when one least expected it. That's what I mean by timing, Don Juan agreed when I described to him this state. What causes this condition of being out of step? I asked. Having lost our connection with our double, he said. I don't understand. Can you explain what you mean? I mean that when we are born we are intrinsically connected to our other side. The lines of communication with the broader picture, so to speak, are open, but as we grow, we gradually cut off that connection and we live with only half our being. Therefore, we are always unbalanced and have the feeling we are missing something. Don Juan paused for a moment as if wondering whether or not to continue. There is something else, he said. It has to do with the way a person is conceived. If you are going to tell me about the theory of the board conception, I already heard that from Clara. Well, hear it again from me, because it obviously hasn't sunk in. The offspring of any lovemaking will be full of energy and will have the power to live in the moment only if both parents were sexually excited. If only one parent had an outburst of excitation, the child's energetic nature will be imbalanced and a part of him will always lag behind. 
if neither of the parents felt very excited, which is usually the case after many years of living with someone, the child will be what we call a bored conception, and he will not be capable of energetically grasping life's flow. That's a dismal scenario, I said. Isn't there anything one can do about it? After all we aren't responsible for what happened during the moment of our conception. Of course there are other factors besides the initial energetic thrust, and that's the challenge of re-establishing the link with the double. Anyone can do that, no matter how lethargically one was conceived. How can one re-establish a link with the double? I asked. By curtailing self-importance. By not being concerned with the concreteness of things. By becoming abstract in one's thinking and behavior. By treating everything as manifestations of energy and not as objective reality. Focusing on the self takes the energy that one needs to act efficiently. For example, to regret past actions or to be too involved or concerned with the outcome of anything weighs a person down so that he cannot act efficiently, spontaneously, and with the proper timing. What if you just don't know what to do or when to do it? I said in a complaining tone. You must stop and wait until you catch the motion of things, Don Juan replied. And listen for the omens, watch the indications emitted from the world around you. They act directly on your energetic body. Of course, for that, you have to be absolutely fluid and have to reduce your desires to nothing. You must feel no hurry and have no need to control or manipulate things. Then you can listen to the world's whispers. Sometimes, omens tell you how to do something. Such as, for example, which plant to pick for a particular ailment. Or they predict the outcome of a course of action. Naturally, other forces can tell you these things too. What other forces are those? The voice of seeing, for example. That comes directly from your energetic body. Or it may come from another entity that advises you. At any rate, it advises you from a place not accessible to your everyday physical body, and you have to open a channel to that place. Don Juan was unusually serious, he kept glancing at the hillside as if waiting for someone or for something to happen. On an impulse, he raised his arms above his head and stretched. I imitated his movements that could be likened to a monkey bracketing on invisible tree branches. I couldn't help noticing that the sky was a cerulean blue, not gray and hazy as in Los Angeles where sometimes you can't see the high rises a few blocks away. The sky was a clear, impenetrable canopy, pure and crystalline. I imagined I could hear sounds from miles away, for there was nothing in the air to impede the waves coming toward us. Sit here for a while, quiet your thoughts and listen to the lava rocks, Don Juan said. I'll go to the other side of the hill so I won't disturb your concentration. You won't disturb my concentration, I said, but he was already walking around a bend. I was about to follow him when it occurred to me that he might have gone to relieve himself behind a boulder. I decided to stay put and try listening to the rocks as he had suggested, although I hadn't the vaguest notion of what he meant by listening to the rocks, or what I was supposed to hear if it did listen to them. It took me a long time to quiet my thoughts, I was angry with my mother for not having been sexually excited when she made me. Although Nelita had told me from her seeing that my father had been beside himself with passion, my mother had not liked him and had barely felt a thing. I blamed her for my deficiencies, for being dependent on others for my well-being, which I was well aware was a disastrous situation. As I was mulling this over in my mind, my eye was caught by a shiny object about twenty feet in front of me. The sun was reflected on a piece of glass, or perhaps it was obsidian, or even a piece of metal. As I gazed at it, my internal dialogue gradually ceased. In the desert where everything is barren, the mind seems to flatten out as if to mirror the terrain. The jagged internal peaks of worry and discontent dissolve so that inside and out there are no barriers, no expectations, no preconceptions to interfere with the natural flow of energy. As I continued my gazing practice, I experienced a moment of welcomed release, as if concerns that had been weighing me down had suddenly been lifted from me. Until that moment, I had not realized the horrendous burden concerns about the self placed upon one. 
it seemed much easier to simply let go, rather than to carry them around like so much useless baggage. I scanned the ground until I found what I was looking for. A rock that was near the shiny object seemed to beckon me. I picked up the rock and looked at it. It was an ordinary piece of lava, light and porous, but somehow, I developed a rapport with it. It may sound strange to form a sympathetic bond with an inanimate object, but that rock had movement inside it. I gazed at it, it was smooth and round and had yellow specks shooting off its black surface. I followed the lines with my eyes. Then I saw the glow around it, a bright buff color that seemed friendly and yet awesome at the same time in its agelessness. Following an inner directive, I held the rock to my abdomen. I didn't expect to hear anything, for I was not listening with my ears, and Don Juan hadn't specified what I had to do, but surprisingly, the amorphous chunk of lava began to tell me things. I assured myself that I was merely imagining it, but it didn't matter, I listened anyway. It was a kind of game I was playing to humor Don Juan so I would have something to report to him later. Mentally, I asked the rock from where it came from, and I immediately received a strong tingling sensation in my womb, and I instantly knew things about the rock that to the rational mind would have been absurd. For example, the rock told me about the depth of the earth from where it had come, saying it was like a womb. It was born, or rather, spewed up by a tremendous force eons ago. It told me how it reckoned time in terms of eons rather than years the way we did, and, seen within the limited temporal range we call history, our lives are insignificant with respect to eons gone by. It told me about our blindness, that grave misconception that we operate under, that we think we manipulate nature and control it, ourselves and others. When actually this is only a mirage, a quality of self-reflection and most of all a scarcity of time. As I held the rock, I had a peculiar sense of seeing the broader picture, in which I was being controlled, driven by relentless forces to an inevitable destruction. I felt this in my midsection as a series of soft ripples. It was a muffled movement coming from within the rock's core as I held it to my abdomen. I was absorbing the rock's essence until my entire body felt as if it were covered in layers of subtle vibration. Then a profound melancholy grasped me, as one existential question after another arose. Why am I alive? Who am I? What is the point of all this? For a while I sat on the hilltop in the middle of nowhere, contemplating the futility of life, when a tremor went through me like the roll of thunder that shook me to the core. I felt a release of feelings that I could not name or isolate. I remembered Clara's words, that there is no end to the wellsprings of man's indulgence. Instead of fighting or containing it, I let the shiver pass until all was still again. I felt exhausted, as if a volcano had erupted spilling forth mountains of clinging and concern. Experiences that I had not thoroughly recapitulation gushed forth so suddenly that I could not stop to examine them, I didn't even have time to do the sweeping breath to breathe those feelings away. I understood how the baggage of memory and experience made me heavy, ponderous, encrusted with concerns about what I thought, felt, wanted to be, or didn't want to be. These mental fabrications served only weigh me down so that I was forever out of synchronization with time and life. I wanted to let go of everything inside me, leave it all behind, start with nothing, so I could be free, but something in me did not want to let go. It clung to life and feared oblivion. Yet, the message of the lava rock was to leave things as they are, not to worry about trivialities, not to strive or interfere. Things will take care of themselves. Live for today, for the weight of all our yesterdays will drag us down, and thoughts of tomorrow will distract us from our present purpose. The rock told me there is a way of perceiving without possessing, and that was by simply allowing life to unfold, to be what it is, outside yet inextricable merged with the self at any particular moment. I looked at the rock and thanked it for its messages. I was about to put it in my pocket to take it with me as a reminder of how important it is to let go when, I felt a tap on my right shoulder. Haven't you learned anything from your gushing realizations? I heard a voice say. Instantly I dropped the rock and looked up petrified, panting instead of breathing. 
there in front of me was Nalida. I received such a jolt to my midsection that I feared I had to go to the bathroom on the spot. Nalita told me to immediately assume a half-sitting, half-kneeling posture that sorcerers use in moments of great upheaval. She helped me tuck my right leg under my crotch with my right foot pressing the perineum, my left knee was bent and my thigh and calf were pressed to my body. Use this posture of protection whenever you received a fright or jolt, she advised. I sat there for a few moments to compose myself. I had the certainty that Nelita had manifested herself out of nowhere on the hillside like the apparition of the Virgin. Then I realized the absurdity of this and told myself that probably Nalita had been waiting on the other side of the hill and Don Juan had told her where to find me. I liked the explanation of the Virgin appearing out of nowhere better. Nalita said with a laugh. I could be the Virgin of the Lava. Let's build a grotto here on this spot. People would come from all over to venerate. As the saying goes, where there is veneration, even rocks emit light. I laughed at her light-hearted humor and began to feel more at ease. Nalita sat down on a nearby boulder, I couldn't help noticing how stylishly she was dressed. She had on khaki culottes and a matching jacket and high black boots that were made of soft Nappa leather. She looked as if she was an advertisement for a travel magazine. Do you envy my outfit? she asked noticing my furtive glances. I felt myself flush. The last thing I wanted to do was to envy Nelita's clothes, but something in me couldn't help it. I was so disheveled, so rumpled that I felt like a sod of earth next to her cool, fresh appearance. How could anyone look so spiffy in the desert? It would never occur to me to dress up to go romping through the boulders and cactus. I wish I didn't envy all the time, I whined. But I can't help it. Every time I see someone with something expensive or good-looking, I want it too. She laughed and reminded me that I had just spent an hour purging myself of desires and attachments. What happened to all your cathartic realizations, little miss, me too, she said smiling. Well, at least your glances don't include men's crotches. I beg your pardon? Why would I look at men's crotches? Nelita smiled. You'd be surprised at how many women are fixated on men's rear ends. Whenever some women pass a man in the street, their eyes automatically wander down in that direction. Well, to me men's crotches are the least interesting part of their anatomy, I said peeved. Perhaps, she said with a sparkle, but my point is that our eyes are trained to seek out things. For some of us it's a good-looking face or derriere, for others it's articles of clothing. We were all trained like monkeys to grasp and covet things. I suppose you're right, I said. But I can't help wanting the exciting things others have. Don't you know that to have possessions is unimportant, she said. There is no need to strive or struggle. Everything takes care of itself. I told her how my mother had spent her entire life struggling to acquire things, china, furniture, knickknacks for the house, and if she didn't have the money to buy certain items, which was usually the case, she would feel deprived and unhappy. There was always that look of disappointment and envy in her eyes whenever we went to visit friends and she saw something for their house like a matching set of cookware, or matching luggage, or when one of her friends showed up with a new dress or coat. I refused to take anything that she had saved for me, when I left, I said defiantly. You may not have taken her embroidered tablecloths that she was saving for you in her hope chest, Nalita said, but you certainly took her envy. You would have been better off taking the napkins and silverware and leaving the coveting behind. That sense of coveting was the legacy that she handed down to you. It's easy to leave something concrete like napkins, I said. Those are real, but envy isn't real. How can I let go of something that isn't real? You begin by recapitulating, Nalita said. I already recapitulated that and it didn't work. It works, but you keep going back to things that you should have let go of long ago. I hadn't even been aware that it was still part of my baggage, I said. Well now you are aware of it, she said, energy leaves from the eyes and also enters through them. So control your glances. 
it's extremely important to train one's eyes. How can one train one's eyes? By placing all your intent in forging your energy body and never deviate from that purpose, Nalita said. Recapitulating is only the beginning. It loosens your affiliation with everyday life and diminishes the force with which objects impinge on the energy from your eyes. Now use that added energy not to reinforce your envy, but to forge your energy body, your double. Instead of reflecting envy, use your eyes to energize the double. Only with your energy body will you be able to make the abstract flight. Why do you call it the abstract flight? I asked. Sorcerers believe that there are other universes besides the one into which you were born, she replied, but only someone who has stored enough energy is able to cross over and move through different intersections. How are the other universes different? I asked. The world we are born into is concrete and is determined by organic matter governed by physical laws, she said. It is linearly organized in terms of time and factually organized in terms of space, but with enough energy we are able to cross over the boundaries that separate worlds upon worlds. Worlds in which energy is inorganic, not linear but circular, ever-present and timeless. Those worlds are not made up of matter, but of energy and awareness, and one can only enter into the other realms by becoming formless and virtually abstract. In essence, one becomes the dream body and this crossing over is the abstract flight. So don't waste your energy on envying concrete objects you can never take with you, but which only burden you down and will make you stay put. Use your energy to forge your energy body so you can make the abstract flight. How do I forge my energy body? I asked. Nelida did not answer but beckoned me with a crook of her index finger to follow her. We left the hilltop and stopped at a clearing where she told me to light a fire. When we gathered enough wood, I lit a fire with my matches. Only then did Nalita make herself comfortable on a large rock and begin talking to me again. One sorcery pass in particular has the intent to forge the energy body, she said. And someday someone will show it to you. Now we must use the flame to change the direction of your eyes so that they will no longer reflect human concerns but the dreaming body, the eyes of the double. She told me to look at the flame through half-closed lids, then turn my head to the left and visualize the fire coming from that direction. I then had to move my head to the center again and looked at the real flame again, and turn my head to the left again and visualize the flame. After repeating this action she said my eyes were fixed away from the direction of everyday life so that the things of the world would no longer have such a strong pull on me.